Chapter 1. The Back Alley Doctor Remifaria, the principality of the beautiful north, was renowned across Samuria for its advanced medical care. Its modern, well-funded hospitals attracted skilled doctors from a multitude of countries, and its cutting-edge medical technology was developed by specialists from the finest manufacturers the principality had to offer. However, despite how brilliantly this nation's medical excellence shone, it concealed a dark side as well. Implementation of orbital technology had been put off for years in the poorer downtown district. As a result, it lacked not only the quality of life, but the level of hospital care that the principality was so known for. Deep in this quiet, run-down area, where the already chilly region's winds seemed to bite with a pronounced sting, stood only a single clinic. The 40-year-old building's age was apparent with but a glance. Its dilapidated exterior did a thorough job of extinguishing any hope of finding a decent general practitioner within. On this particular day, the silhouettes of two people could be seen through its dirty, cracked windows. One million Mira! shouted an older man as his eyes hysterically darted across the sea of zeros that flooded his bill. Across from him sat a large man in his mid-thirties, sporting an unkempt beard that perfectly accented his apathetic demeanor. Few would recognize this massive, muscular figure as a doctor if not for the filthy, frayed lab coat he wore. Ah, my bad. Got that number wrong, didn't I? The doctor answered in a low voice. He took the bill from the older man and quickly scribbled an extra zero on the end. Seeing the price jump by tenfold in an instant, the old man's face changed from an anxious pale to a furious shade of red just as quickly. D dirty swindler! These treatment costs are ridiculous. I refuse to pay this. And indeed, it was far beyond what any legitimate doctor was legally allowed to charge for medical services in Remifaria. Watching the outraged old man sputter and curse, the doctor couldn't help but laugh. Something tells me you've got more than enough Mira sitting around. Hard to say if any of it's clean, but I'll still accept it. Kind man that I am. The patient was a corrupt politician his infamy bolstered by unending rumors surrounding his bribery and tax evasion. He had come to the doctor that day with three bullets in his body. It was apparent by his choice of physician that the politician had landed himself in some manner of serious trouble. Trouble that would ruin his reputation if his wounds had become publicly known. As this particular doctor had extracted the bullets in secret, however, the standard surgery costs had been bolstered by a few additional fees to ensure his silence. I figured that would be more than a fair price in exchange for one's life, the doctor said with a calm tone that only barely concealed the threat behind his words. However, this simply served to provoke the old man even further. In a rage, he drew a concealed horrible gun and thrust it into the doctor's back. The doctor, unperturbed, simply continued smiling. Oh, well as your physician, I feel I should advise you... Your treatment isn't quite complete just yet. If you put a bullet in me, I certainly won't be able to take that last one out of you. He turned and pointed his finger at the old man's stomach. Running his hand over the spot the doctor indicated, the old man felt a jolt of pain. There was something hard still lodged under his skin. The doctor had intentionally left the last bullet untouched. Realizing the position he was in, the old man lowered his gun, a look of pained defeat on his face. I trust that clears up the issue of the bill then. The flames of anger left the old man's eyes. All that remained was fear. Shortly afterward, the doctor finished the surgery. The doctor's name was Glenn. Despite being an exceptionally talented doctor, he was unaffiliated with any of the hospitals in the principality. Known as a back alley doctor, he treated everyone from politicians to illegal immigrants to murderers and demanded outrageous prices in return for his secrecy. A few days later, Glenn sat in his worn-down chair and gazed absently at the suitcase containing ten million Mira that had been delivered to his clinic. He moved his gaze to the window and stared at the heavy drops of rain splashing against the pane. It was uncommon to get such laden raindrops in the colder northern climate of Remifaria. Surely no clients would be showing up today of all days he thought to himself as sheets of water began pounding on his window, and the din of the rain grew even louder outside. P pardon me The sudden sound of a voice from behind him snapped Glenn out of his thoughts. He turned his head to see a nurse standing in the hallway of his dilapidated clinic.
Chapter 2. The Request Is there a doctor by the name of Glenn here? The nurse asked with a smooth, dignified tone as she stood there in the entryway of the clinic. She had a youthful beauty to her. Glenn guessed that she must have been in her early twenties. Yeah, that would be me. Glenn motioned for her to come in. She bowed, folded her umbrella, and closed the door behind her. The umbrella clearly hadn't served her well in the windy downpour outside. Raindrops trickled from her bangs, running down her cheeks onto the fabric of her uniform, the front of which was completely sodden. Glenn carelessly threw the mirror case in a corner, grabbed a clean white towel from a nearby shelf, and tossed it to the nurse. She thanked him and quickly dried her wet hair. As Glenn watched her, he noticed that her movements had a certain charm to them. Getting a better look at her face, he found himself utterly captivated for a moment. So much so that he nearly blurted out something along the lines of, Haven't we met before? He stopped himself in time, however, not wanting to utter such a painfully cliched pickup line. He cleared his throat in order to regain his composure and then offered her a seat. So, what do you want from me? He asked. My name is Sherry. I work as a nurse at Ameria General Hospital. A boy with an incurable disease was hospitalized just today. I request that you operate on him. Silence filled the clinic. Surprised by the lack of a response, Sherry tilted her head inquisitively. A moment later, the response came. It started as a stifled chuckle, but quickly exploded into a great booming laughter. Glenn knew about Ameria. It was one of the biggest hospitals in the Principality, personally backed by the head of state, the Prince. It was a facility said to have brought together the best doctors from far and wide, and one that sported the latest medical technology and the most cutting-edge techniques. It was also a hospital that was protective of its image. Patients deemed incurable were outsourced, so as to not reflect poorly on the hospital's track record. For a back-alley doctor like Glenn whose business relied heavily on confidentiality, this wasn't an unusual request. The thought of the high and mighty hospital administrators having to resort to asking a displaced doctor like himself for help was always a great source of amusement to him, however. Well, did the distinguished gentleman in that ivory tower of a hospital mention how much is in it for me? Glenn's jovial mood subsided, and he instantly switched to a business-like demeanor. If he was going to be doing their dirty work, he planned to make sure the compensation was thorough. Sherry sternly stared back before responding, her voice firm with determination. There appears to be a misunderstanding. I'm not making this request on behalf of the hospital. This is my own personal request. Wait, what? Glenn was taken off his guard by the sudden admission. Averting her eyes, Sherry continued. The boy... My patient suffers from crystallization. Crystallization. Glenn's eyes widened at the name. He knew it well. Further, he now understood exactly why she had come to him. The disease had great significance to Glenn, as it was not an exaggeration to say it was the sole reason he became a back-alley doctor in the first place. Take me to the patient. I'll decide what I'll do after a medical examination, he said without hesitation. Sherry nodded in agreement. Chapter 3. The Patient As the two of them made their way to the hospital, the rain let up, draping them in a cold, humid air. From a fair distance off, their destination could be seen, standing proudly against the gray sky above. It's quite the place, isn't it? Glenn mumbled, half to himself, as they arrived. Ameria General Hospital was built only last year. It was a marvelous structure, pristine and dignified. Clearly a project the prince himself could be proud of. Dr. Glenn, this way. Sherry ushered the awestruck Glenn further inside. Given that he was an outsider not employed by the hospital, it was against Ameria's policy for Glenn to examine a patient. Knowing this, he had hoped to stand out as little as possible. However... Walking through the spotless gleaming halls of the bright white ward only served to highlight the dirt and stains covering Glenn's shabby coat and the tangled mess of hair that covered his head. Stares from patients and staff alike bore down on him as he hurriedly followed Sherry. She led him through a number of corridors until they finally arrived at the pediatric ward, room number 303. 
Sherry knocked thrice before entering. Inside, a young boy of about 14 years old lay in a hospital bed. As Sherry entered, he turned to her and puffed his cheeks up in indignation. Sherry, where were you? The boy whined to an apologetic Sherry. Brazen would be a perfect description of the child, but it was apparent that he and Sherry were close. Sherry introduced Glenn to the boy, whose name was Hugo. Hugo greeted Glenn with a friendly, Nice to meet ya. Glenn, however, didn't respond. Instead, he swept his eyes around the room. Spotting a violin leaning against the wall, he remembered what Sherry had told him along the way. Said to be a violin prodigy, Hugo had already won a great number of competitions before even reaching his teens. The month prior, magazines had run features on him, praising the young musician's skill. Just when his fame was beginning to soar, however, he was struck with crystallization. Glenn looked down at the boy and saw that he wore thick gloves on both hands. Upon seeing the gloves, the grizzled doctor made a sour face. He knew the patients with the disease would often use gloves to conceal their symptoms. Let's start the medical exam, Glenn bluntly announced, quickly approaching Hugo and forcefully grabbing the boy's right wrist. What are you doing? Hugo began struggling, but couldn't break free from Glenn's iron grip. In fact, most adults would have found it difficult to escape from the doctor's brawny arms. Sherry wordly watched over the tactless examination as Glenn removed the glove from the still-struggling boy's hand. Glenn's breath caught in his throat upon seeing the gleam. There, at the end of the boy's arm, where there should have been a small, tender hand, sat a cold, crystalline mass. It shone with a familiar green color, that of an esmolus gemstone. It was unmistakable. This was crystallization. Chapter 4 Crystallization On closer inspection, the crystal resembled a carving of a human hand down to the finest detail, like an exquisite work of art. But a sculptor talented and experienced enough to craft something so precisely lifelike had yet to be born. The reason was because this dazzling esmolus crystal truly was once Hugo's hand. The effects would manifest quickly, transforming the body beginning from the tips of one's fingers or toes, the process did not result in any pain, but the parts of the body affected would remain lifelessly frozen in place. If left untreated, it would continue to spread up the limb, and after about a month, it would reach the heart, resulting in death. This disease was known as crystallization. Its cause was unknown, and the only treatment that could save the victim from a cruel death was amputating the crystallized parts of the body before it spread. Hugo could survive, but at oblique costs for an aspiring violinist like himself. Glenn stood transfixed, staring at the boy's hand. Memory surged through his mind like flashes of lightning. When he was still a respectable doctor, he had tried to take on this very disease, but all it had brought him was, Let go of me already, you big idiot! The boy's outburst snapped Glenn back to his senses, wriggling back and forth wildly, Hugo finally managed to wrench himself free of the doctor's mighty arm. He then launched into a verbal assault on Glenn, frustrated that this stranger had seen the state of his hand. The doctor waited patiently for Hugo to finish. Finally, overcome with emotion, the young boy broke down in tears. Damn it! What did you do that for? He cried as Sherry comforted him. It took a while to settle him down, but eventually he crawled back into his bed, pouting. Glenn and Sherry left the boy and stepped outside the room. For a while, the two of them stood in silence. It was Glenn who first spoke. The Brett's crystallization is at an early stage. If he's operated on immediately, his life will be saved. Any surgeon at this hospital can do an amputation. He paused. What do you want from me? The quiet tone of Glenn's voice was a far cry from his earlier forcefulness. It was clear all his spirit had evaporated upon seeing the boy's condition. Hugo's dream is to become a professional violinist, Sherry began, and he has more than enough talent to make it come true. For him, that dream is equal to his life. Dr. Glenn, I want you to cure his crystallization without sacrificing his hands. Sherry looked up at the doctor with pleading eyes. I want you to make the impossible possible. possible. 
Doctors aren't gods, Glenn said, casting his gaze downward. Hearing his response, Sherry felt what little hope she had evaporate. She tried to find something to say to change Glenn's mind, but no words came to her. In turn, he said nothing more himself. It was neither Glenn nor Sherry that broke the pained silence between them. Chapter 5 Rufus It's no use. That man can't do it. Glenn and Sherry looked up to see someone standing in the quiet corridor of the hospital. He was a slender, tall man clad in a spotless white coat. He cast a piercing gaze at them from behind his silver-rimmed glasses. Doctor! Being a nurse at Ameria General Hospital, Sherry knew him as one of the doctors and worked with him daily. Glenn also happened to know this man, though it had been ten years since they last spoke. Rufus. Glenn, what are you doing here? Rufus scowled. Sherry's lack of surprise at this exchange suggested she was aware the two of them were acquainted. However, she could do little more than watch dejectedly as the tension rose in the air. Rufus looked at her and sighed, an annoyed crease forming in his brow. What made you think it was a good idea to bring some back alley doctor like him here? You should know this could hurt the hospital's reputation. The look in Sherry's eyes switched to one of resolve. She was well aware of the consequences when she brought Glenn with her and was not about to give up just yet. What do you mean by can't? She asked as if challenging Rufus's words. Glenn found himself wondering why Sherry's patient, the boy in the nearby room, was so important to her. However, he decided against voicing this question for the moment and stood in silence. Simple. That man abandoned his work. When it came down to it, he ran away from being a doctor. No matter how skilled he may be, someone like him is incapable of curing the incurable. He cannot stop the crystallization disorder. Glenn let out a dry, bitter laugh, as though to agree with Rufus. Then, without saying anything further, he turned and began walking away. Dr. Glenn! Sherry hastily followed after him. Rufus looked on as the two of them made their way down the hall. As they turned a corner, Rufus uttered a quiet, hmm, before turning his attention to the nearby room, room 303. The room where Hugo was staying. He cleared his throat and knocked three times on the door. Hugo, it's time for your checkup. From the rooftop of Ameria General Hospital, Glenn gazed down at the city streets lined with high-end stores and well-kept houses. The view, riddled with signs of the advanced orbital technology the country had been integrating, brought him no peace, however. Instead, it only made him miss the rough-hewn charm of the city's declining downtown. He felt it suited him much better than such a pristine sight. Sherry stood behind him, a worried expression on her face. Doctor, I- Rufus, how good is his work? Glenn asked, more to interrupt her and change the subject than out of any actual curiosity. Unable to get around his deflection, she had no choice but to answer the sudden question. Dr. Rufus was scouted when this hospital was first founded. He saved many lives over the course of his career. In addition, he's published a great number of research papers- there are even rumors that he's going to be hired as a professor, despite only being 34. Huh. He's an ordinary man, doing good in his own ordinary way, Glenn said with a satisfied look. Even that ordinary man wants to save the boy's life, Sherry shouted. Her outburst faded to a muted tone, however, as she continued. But he plans to amputate Hugo's hands. If that's what'll save the boy's life, then that's what should be done, Glenn said matter-of-factly. He expected this conversation to end there, just as their previous exchange in the hallway had. Sherry would not accept this outcome, however. Dr. Glenn, ten years ago, you devised a surgical method to reverse the crystallization process. That's why, even if it's a risk, if there's a chance Hugo might be able to keep his hands... I want to bet on your success. Hearing that caught Glenn by surprise. Glenn chanced upon the idea years ago. A revolutionary technique, able to reverse the process of the disease. To cure it without amputating crystallized parts. It really would make the impossible possible. Certainly, if it worked, Hugo's life and dream alike would be saved. But even so, 
The thought of revisiting that chapter of his past only reopened a scar in Glenn's soul. After a few moments of silence, he spoke quietly. You know that technique was a failure, right? Sherry cast her eyes downward in silence. She knew about the operation's outcome. And because of that, I lost her. With a somber tone, Glenn began to recount the story of his past, of the incident, ten years ago. Chapter 6. Katerina Ten years ago, Glenn worked with Rufus at a hospital in the Principality of Remiferia. The two of them, blessed with talent, were promising names among the young doctors. One day, the two visited a small theater where they saw a traditional Remifarian dance known as a ballet. The dancer on stage was incredibly talented, and both men were awestruck, instantly falling for her. Her name was Katerina Ford. The two doctors came back many times to watch her perform and, as if by fate, somehow became acquainted with this girl, whose smile shone like the sun. The two men even got to know her child sister, who took a liking to them as well. It wasn't long before Glenn and Katerina fell in love. They were such a perfect match that even Rufus, his friend and rival in love, wholeheartedly supported the couple. However, their happy days together would be all too short. One day, Katerina came down with an incurable disease and was hospitalized at Glenn and Rufus' workplace. The disease in question was none other than crystallization. Her legs, the life of a ballerina, were immobilized, converted to beautiful esmolus crystal up to her ankles. Huh, it's pretty, right? She said, smiling and holding the gemstone that was once her foot up to the light. It was Katerina's way of staying strong and positive, typical of her bright personality. Glenn and Rufus, the doctors charged with her care, found it increasingly difficult to have such an outlook, however. To save her life, they both knew there was no other way than to amputate the crystallized feet. It had to be done soon. But despite everything, they couldn't bring themselves to take such a drastic measure, for Katerina's heart still burned with passion for dancing a passion that would be cruelly snuffed out were she to undergo an amputation. The doctor searched desperately for an alternative, any possible method to save both her life and her legs. They scoured the records of all known cases of crystallization. They examined and re-examined her to try to find the real cause. Any possible lead or hypothesis was followed up on as quickly as possible. One day, their frantic work finally paid off. Glenn had made a discovery. Patients with crystallization all had a common symptom, a small tumor in the heart. Initial studies suggested that this growth secreted a specific type of toxin that was then dispersed through the bloodstream and deposited in the extremities of the body. When it accumulated in great enough quantities, it would convert the patient's hands and feet into the familiar green crystals. If the tumor could be surgically removed, the root cause would be no more, and the condition would slowly reverse over time. Though the medical world was excited over these findings, the two doctors in charge of Katerina did not rejoice. The removal of a tumor inside the heart was an extremely dangerous operation. Even in a country as renowned for top-tier medical practices as Remiferia was, it would be an intensely difficult surgery. If they failed, it would mean her death. But time was not on their side. The crystallization was advancing. They had to make a decision. The only option is to remove the crystallized parts. Choosing between life and ballet is foolish, Rufus asserted, not wanting to go through with such a risky procedure. Glenn agreed with his conclusion. Even if his love would lose her ability to dance, as long as she had her life, she could find a new passion. However, Katerina disagreed. Ballet is everything to me. Losing my legs is no different than losing my life. If there is even a small chance that you can do it, I want to bet on your success, she begged her beloved Glenn. As the operation neared, Glenn grew more conflicted by the day. She was betting on his success, but with her life as the chips. The closer the surgery drew, the more he began to worry. In the end, her wishes got through to him, and he decided to do as she asked. Rufus was fiercely opposed. <laughs> 
but upon seeing the look in Glenn's eyes, he understood his friend's resolve. Seeing that Glenn would do anything to save her, he realized there was nothing he could say or do that would stop him. The day arrived. Glenn was to be the surgeon. Katerina's sister looked on with concern as Katerina was transported to the operating room. I believe in you, Glenn, whispered Katerina. Grasping Glenn's rugged hand, she fell into a deep sleep under the anesthesia. She never woke up. Glenn's story was finished by Rufus as he stepped out to join Glenn and Sherry on the rooftop. Afterward, Glenn abandoned the hospital. He ran away from Katerina's death and became a good-for-nothing back-alley doctor. Upon hearing Rufus' words, Sherry glanced over at Glenn. What do you want, Rufus? Glenn didn't look up at his old friend. He simply continued staring down at the city below. Rufus took a moment to choose his words carefully before finally replying. The date for Hugo's operation has been decided. It's one week from today. Chapter 7. The Clash Upon hearing the news from Rufus, Sherry immediately objected. W wait Dr. Rufus, it's too soon. Unfortunately, the symptoms of crystallization will not wait. We need to operate as soon as we can, Rufus responded. Glenn, his back turned to them, did not show any reaction. He simply continued to gaze down at the city as he silently listened. We discussed this with Hugo, and he consented to it. As a nurse, you aren't in a position to object, he continued. His cold statement temporarily got the better of Sherry. Without any way to dispute Rufus' words, she bit her lip in a pained dismay. The worst part was, she knew he was right. Hugo's 14-year-old body was much smaller than an average adult's, so the time left until the crystallization reached his heart was also shorter. It was a natural, logical decision for a doctor to proceed with the surgery as soon as possible. Even so, Sherry protested, Doctor, do you think nothing of Hugo losing his hands? What I am concerned with, Rufus replied without hesitation, is whether he loses his life. Preserving that is my top priority. He won't be able to pursue any dream if he dies. In his words, Sherry could feel the pain he felt at losing Katerina. Knowing this, she couldn't hide her sorrow. Rufus looked past Sherry to the large-framed doctor who was still looking out over the city. I will save the child, he declared to Glenn. Good. Saves me the trouble of declining, Glenn said as he turned and began to leave, his eyes avoiding Rufus as he passed. Do your best, Dr. Rufus. He nonchalantly waved goodbye, his back turned to the others as he exited the rooftop. Pathetic, muttered Rufus. With that over, he urged Sherry to return to work telling her that he would let the fact that she had secretly called in an unregistered doctor slide this time. Her shoulders sagged. As she listened, her eyes were fixed on the ground. She was lost in her thoughts and swirling emotions. Don't involve him. It will only make this more difficult for you, Rufus concluded. Sherry raised her head at those words and looked into Rufus' eyes. I'm sorry, Dr. Rufus. There's one thing I forgot to tell Dr. Glenn. And what? Rufus asked, confused. Sherry did not answer the question, however. She simply began hurrying after Glenn. Rufus was left alone on the roof. The wind began to pick up, causing his white coat to flutter. He rubbed his temples and let out a long, deep sigh. Chapter 8. Irritation Glenn returned to his clinic downtown. He found the place just as he had left it. After walking through the pristine white halls of the hospital, however, he was all the more aware of how shabby and disorderly his tiny little clinic was. He glanced over to the corner where he had thrown the case full of Mira. It still sat there, nestled among dusty cobwebs. Even if the building he worked out of was 40 years old, it would surely be in better shape if he maintained it every now and then. And thanks to his confidentiality fees, it wasn't as though he lacked for Mira. He simply didn't have the energy for it. Glenn, you're a respectable doctor, Katerina would chide him. You should care more about how you look. 
Her words bubbled up in his mind as he slumped down in his worn-out chair. It was something she had said to him on more than one occasion back when she was still alive. Being a ballerina, she was always conscious of her appearance, both on and off the stage. Katerina was elegant, beautiful, and bright. She was everything Glenn lacked, which is also what attracted him to her in the first place. In all likelihood, the same was true of Rufus as well. Glenn's mind darted to another familiar thought, one he had repeatedly dwelt on for the past decade. How would have everything turned out if she had chosen Rufus instead of him? After coming down with crystallization, she was left with but two options. Give up her legs to ensure her survival, or try to save her legs by gambling with her very life. She chose the latter, and begged Glenn to attempt the risky surgery. Though initially unsure, he eventually sympathized with her and attempted it. Had she been with Rufus, however... In Glenn's mind, there was a chance Rufus would have chosen to go against her wishes in order to save her life. If things had turned out that way, she would have survived. Even without her legs, she would still be around. She might have even found a new passion, one just as dear to her as ballet was. Glenn knew all too well that thinking on what-ifs was utterly useless. Yet, even so, he had spent every single day in the ten years since her death going over every detail, replaying every mistake and theorizing every other possible outcome. Each day, sinking a little further into his regret until he was drowning in it, no longer able to see the surface. Today was different, though. After returning from Ameria, Glenn's heart churned like a stormy sea. Was seeing Hugo's crystallized hands the cause? Did hearing how the boy had to choose between his dreams and his life hit too close to home? Perhaps it was simply from seeing Rufus again after all these years. Or maybe it was all the above. Coming up against such a familiar situation, having to relive the same traumatic events that sent him down the path to becoming a back alley doctor. Regardless of the cause, he was irritated. Drawing short, ragged breaths, he went to his desk and opened the second drawer. After digging in the back for a moment, he dragged out an old, massive file. It bore no title but one look at its size and the sheer number of papers stuffed in it was a clear sign of just how many years it took to compile. Glenn stared at it in silence for a moment. Suddenly, a white-hot rage bubbled up inside of him, and using the full force of his brawny arms, he threw the file with all his might. It hit the wall with a dull thud, bursting open and scattering its contents all over the floor. The outburst did not bring Glenn any peace, however. As he watched the paper flutter down before him, the only thing he felt was his battered heart breaking even further. Doctor? The sudden sound of a voice from behind him snapped Glenn out of his thoughts. He turned his head to see someone standing in the hallway. It was the nurse from Ameria General Hospital, Sherry. She looked around the room in surprise at the paper scattered across the floor. If this is about the operation, it was already settled. Remember... Glenn growled in a low voice, glaring angrily at her. She was taken aback for a moment at the darkness in his gaze, but quickly regained her composure. I've only come here to tell you something I'd forgotten to mention before, she said. Something you forgot to mention? Glenn said, his patience running thin. Glenn's furious glare would quickly transform into a bewildered expression, however, as she continued... Sherry is just my nickname, she said in a firm voice. My full name is Cheryl Ford. The woman you loved, the one who lost her life to crystallization. I'm her sister. Chapter 9 Sherry You're Katerina's sister? The shock of it all sent Glenn reeling for a moment. Sherry remained composed, however. She looked straight at him and nodded. Looking into her eyes, it was clear to Glenn she was telling the truth. Cheryl. He remembered the name. She was Katerina's younger sister. He had seen her many times during Katerina's hospital stay. Cheryl had been with her older sister on the faded day, right up until she was taken into the operating room. Looking closer at Sherry, the resemblance was obvious. She had a familiar kind of dignity and elegance in her eyes, 
and the same grace in her movements Katerina once had. Glenn felt ashamed at failing to recognize her. Was he so disconnected from those he once cared for? He stood there a moment, lost in his thoughts. Sherry broke the silence. Your cure for crystallization cost my sister her life. But why did she request such a risky surgery in the first place? Have you ever thought about the reason, Dr. Glenn? It was so she could keep her legs and continue being a ballerina. Glenn responded reflexively. Sherry shook her head. It wasn't just that. The day after you discovered the idea, she told me she wanted to try it. I was against it. I'd heard it was very risky. I told her I wanted her to give up ballet in order to guarantee she would live. But she didn't hesitate in her reply. Sherry closed her eyes and put a hand to her chest as she recounted her late sister's words. I want to do it, not just for my own sake or so that I can continue ballet. This is a terrible illness. When I was told the only way I could survive would involve losing my legs, I was in despair. But when Glenn told me he'd discovered a new surgical technique to cure it, I felt a warm light shining inside my heart. I think this is what hope is. If this method succeeds, it could bring that same hope to other patients with crystallization. I know this operation is still imperfect and comes with a high risk, but that's exactly why I want to be the first to try it. Whether it succeeds or fails, I'm sure that Glenn will learn something and be able to perfect it further. Before long, nobody will have to fear crystallization. Because, one way or another, my beloved Glenn will succeed. Hearing Katerina's words, Glenn couldn't shake the feeling that she was talking directly to him through her sister. Sherry continued, I mourn the death of my sister too. And yet, I can't help but recall how you and Dr. Rufus did everything you could to save her. The respect I had for the two of you led me to pursue nursing. So please, doctor, don't regret your choice. Her message delivered, she bowed. After a long moment of silence, she raised her head and quietly left the clinic. Glenn, still speechless, slowly and shakily lowered himself down into his chair. For what seemed like hours, he stared at the spot where Sherry had stood. The irritation he had felt before had vanished, leaving a sudden clarity he hadn't felt in a long time. He now finally knew what Katerina had been thinking back then. He had heard her words from ten years ago, and her sister had left him with parting words of her own. Don't regret your choice. All he had to do now was decide how to respond. The next morning, Glenn began carefully picking up the papers scattered across his floor. The regret and anger that filled his eyes the day before had been replaced by the fires of determination. Chapter 10 Hope it was the evening three days before Hugo's amputation was to take place. After the date had been decided, Rufus, as the boy's doctor, had been visiting his room each day to explain a little more about the procedure. Are you listening, Hugo? Rufus asked in a tactful tone of voice. Since his surgery had been scheduled, Hugo had been absent-minded and listless. The reason was clear to everyone there. He had no hope for a future without his hands a future where he would never again play the violin. Sherry, the nurse assigned to care for Hugo and his sister Rufus, could hardly bear it. I hate this, Hugo said suddenly, gazing down at the thick gloves that covered his crystallized hands. Why me? Why am I the one that has to go through this? Sherry bit her lip to hold back her frustration. It'll be okay, Hugo, she said. Having lost her sister to the illness, she knew just how hollow her words must have sounded to the boy, but she couldn't think of anything else to say to him. Dr. Rufus, however, calmly responded, I've seen many patients over the course of my career. Among them, there were some whose lives slipped away without even so much as a glimmer of hope that they might survive. In your case, however, your survival can be guaranteed. As long as you undergo the procedure, 
you will live on. You will be able to find a new path in life. I think that's fortunate, don't you? His words left the boy no room to object. Hugo gritted his teeth for a moment, but seemed to deflate a bit afterward, as though resigning himself to his fate. This is fine, Rufus thought. As long as he lives, he will still have possibilities. He only needs to find a new passion, not like Katerina. When she lost her life, she also lost all her potential futures. An answer like that is just like you, a baritone voice interrupted. Everyone there turned to look at the entrance to the room. There, his burly figure filling the doorframe, stood the back alley doctor. Dr. Glenn, Sherry gasped, her heart filled with relief for what felt like the first time in a while. Glenn showed her a small smile. Why are you here? Rufus adjusted his glasses and shot a glare at the unkempt man from behind his silver rims. Without answering, Glenn merely stared back, the look in his eyes alone repelling the question. Rufus frowned. The Glenn that stood before him now seemed worlds apart from the man he last saw on the hospital's roof. Glenn looked at Hugo in the bed. A flash of discomfort briefly washed over the boy's face as he recalled the doctor's previous rough treatment. The feeling quickly faded, however, as the apathy and despair that had taken hold of Hugo's heart reasserted itself. Your name is Hugo, right? Glenn asked, looking down at the boy in the hospital bed. Tell me, are you willing to risk dying? Glenn's abrupt statement startled everyone present. Not waiting for a response, Glenn continued. There is a procedure that can cure your crystallization without amputating your hands. But it comes with a high risk. It's not something you can just overcome through sheer determination. The danger is real and the consequences could be fatal. You must be willing to accept that. Are you? Each word he uttered was like a weight dropped on the 14-year-old's mind. The look in Glenn's eyes made it clear. He was not overstating how risky this procedure was. It truly could result in Hugo's death. But if he had the resolve, if he was willing to take that risk, then everything could be over without losing his hands, without losing his musical aspirations. Hugo, overcome with emotion, started to cry. The wishes he had buried, the feelings he had repressed for the sake of his survival, burst out from him all at once. I, I, I would die for these hands! The light of hope was shining in his heart. Chapter 11. Resolve Hugo, you should reconsider, Rufus swiftly interjected. Though he was addressing Hugo, his gaze was fixed squarely on Glenn. Rufus shot a fierce glare at his former colleague. This procedure to cure him without losing his hands, is it the same procedure you attempted on Katerina? You should know better than anyone what a failure that was. The cold anger in Rufus' voice pierced Glenn like icy daggers. In response, Glenn held up the thick file he was carrying. This is the result of all the research I've done in the ten years since I became a back-alley doctor. He tossed the file to Rufus, who was taken off guard for a moment by its sheer weight. He began scanning through the documents. The file contained an enormous amount of research about crystallization, clinical records, medical cases, reports of procedures and results. It was obvious some materials were illegally obtained, but they were all highly informative. As Rufus reached the final document in the file, his eyes widened. The document was a highly detailed description of a new surgical procedure, different from the one Rufus knew of, the one that had cost Katerina her life. I developed that after going over everything that happened during Katerina's surgery back then. It's all thanks to her, Glenn said quietly before falling silent. It was clear he had continued fighting the crystallization disease for a long time, even after he left lawful medical practice. Years of treating patients as a back-alley doctor had allowed him to research and perfect a new procedure. Because, one way or another, my beloved Glenn will succeed. Realizing her sister's words were right, Sherry began to softly cry. It is true that by performing the procedure this way, the odds of the patient's survival should be greatly increased, said Rufus after glancing over the document. The effectiveness of Glenn's perfected technique was immediately clear to him. 
Hugo even perked up upon hearing Rufus' approval. However, Rufus then looked up at Glenn, the same icy glare still in his eyes. Even so, I cannot hand my patient over to you. Wh- why Sherry stammered, bewildered. Glenn simply stood silently as Rufus continued. I've heard from Sherry how Katarina faced the danger of that surgery in order to give you more experience, to ensure that even if she did not survive, others would. She had the resolve to sacrifice her own life for that. But you? Rufus' eyes narrowed as he continued to glare at Glenn. In the face of her death, you chose to run. You fled the hospital to go wallow in an alley for a decade. Your resolve is nowhere near hers. And I refuse to entrust one of my patients to someone as weak-willed as you. Glenn closed his eyes and let Rufus' words sink in. They cut through him like finely honed blades, made all the more sharp by the fact that he knew every word was true. You're absolutely right, he said. Back then, I didn't even have the bare minimum of resolve needed to take down this disease. As a result, I ran away and started drowning in my regrets. Glenn looked at Rufus square in the eye. But you know what? Thanks to these past ten years of wallowing in an alley, I've learned a few things. As he finished speaking, he moved his hand to his hip. He felt the familiar sensation of the cold, metallic object he had concealed there. Holding the grip firmly, he pulled it out and pointed it directly at Rufus. It took Rufus a moment to register what was going on, but when his eyes finally focused on the object now hovering right before the tip of his nose... He realized he was looking down the barrel of a Reinford-made Orwell gun. The light from the setting sun flooded through the room's windows and cast a golden gleam on the weapon's surface. Despite the warm light, it felt as though the air in the room had suddenly froze. Are you threatening me? Rufus finally forced out a question to break his stunned silence. His tone was defiant, but he could do nothing to hide his trembling. Glenn smirked wryly and began to move his finger toward the trigger. Then... Suddenly, in one fluid motion, he flipped the gun around in his hand. The muzzle spun toward him, and the situation was reversed with it. Since the patient bears a risk of dying, it only makes sense that I, as his doctor, should also bear an equal risk, Glenn said, offering the gun to Rufus. If the surgery doesn't succeed, I want you to use this to kill me. It was clear from the steely look in Glenn's eyes that he was absolutely serious. This was his unique resolve, forged from years of dealing with criminals. The resolve only a doctor of the underworld could have. A heavy silence fell over the room as everyone there awaited Rufus' answer. He calmly closed his eyes, his expression hidden by the sunlight reflecting off his lenses. After a moment, he reached out and grabbed the grip of the gun. Huh, what a stupid stunt, he said, a small grin on his face but your resolve seems to be real enough at least. If you truly think this procedure of yours can save Hugo, then I'll bet on your success too. Chapter 12. The Operation Rufus summoned all the doctors who were to be involved in the operation, now taking place in two days, to one of the hospital's conference rooms. There, he introduced Glenn's new surgical procedure to them arguing it was the most effective means of dealing with crystallization. However, he received a cold response from the other doctors at first. They were not about to easily trust some unlicensed doctor running a back alley clinic. Not only were his skills called into question, but his shady reputation preceded him, making it difficult for the pair to gain any ground in the prestigious hospital. Despite this, Rufus was undeterred and continued to lobby for their approval in performing the procedure. His ardent persuasion, combined with the impressive merits of the procedure and Glenn's thorough explanation of it, slowly won them over, and one by one, they withdrew their objections. With the hospital on board with the plan, Rufus and Glenn began going over the steps of the surgery, over and over, every single day they had before it was scheduled to take place. They wanted to do everything they could to ensure things would go as planned. For her part, Nurse Sherry continued to look after Hugo. His mood had undergone a dramatic change the past few days. Before, when he was certain he would lose his hands, his eyes were dull and listless. But now they were bright and alive. He had hope. All too soon, the day of the operation arrived. 
Hugo's parents, whose jobs had unfortunately kept them unable to frequently visit the hospital in person, made time to come see their son into surgery. I'll see you soon, he said to them as he was wheeled to the operating room. Both he and his parents were aware there was a chance those would be his final words. And so, he gave them a brilliant smile as reassurance before he was taken away. He had no fear himself. The presence of the two excellent doctors overseeing the operation was all he needed. Hugo was given anesthesia and finally taken into the operating room. Glenn and Rufus were sterilized, and the surgical instruments that had been prepared were laid out. As the attending physician, Glenn stood before the unconscious patient. The other doctors, led by Rufus, took the cue and headed to their respective positions. For the first time in nearly a decade, Glenn had tidied himself up. He was now wearing clean, light blue surgical attire. His normally scraggly hair had been tied back and almost gave his appearance a hint of elegance, or at least it would have, had it not been safely tucked into a surgical cap. Nurse Sherry was there as well, attending the operation as an assistant to Glenn and Rufus. She exchanged a wordless glance with Glenn, and he nodded in response. At long last, the time had come. Well then, I'll start the procedure, Glenn announced. Rufus handed him a scalpel, and he began. He skillfully drew the sharpened tool across the incision lines that had been marked on the boy's chest, and the skin parted without resistance. As humanity evolved, so too did the human body refine itself over countless generations. Its various systems and parts came together to work as one beautiful whole, like an elegant link of horrible gears. The body is an incredible machine, astronomically more complex than anything mankind was able to create, despite all their advances. And yet, as incredible as they are, bodies will still break down. Whether due to illness or injuries, a body will require repair and maintenance. It is the doctor's job to fix that which is broken and restore a body to working condition, to do whatever is required to prolong the dazzling gleam of life as much as possible. No matter if it was in the spotless operating room of a prestigious hospital or the worn, grungy halls of his back alley clinic, each time Glenn performed a surgery, it was a duty he felt delighted and privileged to be able to perform. He was grateful to the goddess for giving him such a talent. With that gratitude in his heart and the skillful movements of the scalpel in his hand, Hugo's operation was progressing smoothly. Everyone in attendance stood in awe of Glenn's artful surgical skills as they played their own parts to perfection. Sherry wiped the sweat from his brow, Rufus handled the surgical tools, and the other doctors oversaw key elements such as medical equipment and anesthesia. At last, the boy's heart was exposed. Reaching this part in a surgery typically took quite some time, but after watching Glenn's effortless movements, it almost seemed to everyone there like it had taken no time at all. Down in Hugo's chest cavity, his heart beat with a healthy tempo and color. Healthy, with the exception of the sinister, dark mass that clung to the organ's surface. This was the cause of everything. The tumor that resulted in the body's crystallization. This malignant growth that had taken Katerina's life, and countless others. A little more. Hang in there, Hugo. Sherry whispered to the sleeping boy. But as Glenn stared at the murky tumor that sat in front of him, his hand froze in place. Chapter 13 Prayer What's wrong? Rufus asked, noticing Glenn's sudden hesitation. Dr. Glenn? Sherry looked up at him with concern. The other doctors looked on in confusion, not understanding what had happened. The moment Glenn caught sight of Hugo's pulsing heart, Marred by that small blackened lump, his mind was pulled back to Katerina's surgery. On that day, ten years ago, everything had progressed smoothly, and by all appearances, the operation had been successful. Heart surgery is always a highly dangerous undertaking, but Glenn, gifted with talent as he was, had succeeded in removing the crystallization tumor without incident. Everyone participating in the surgery watched as the color returned to the heart, believing they had finally triumphed over the disease. 
They had been too quick to celebrate, however. The tumor had been more closely tied to the surrounding tissue than expected, and removing it weakened the wall of the heart considerably. Just as Glenn was closing up the chest, the part of the heart where the tumor once sat tore open, resulting in a large hemorrhage. Katerina's life flickered out swiftly thereafter. As Glenn stared at the familiar sight of the tumor on Hugo's heart, his own was gripped by fear. The fear that history would repeat itself, that he would be responsible for another death. Glenn's body stiffened. His mind went blank, and his focus shattered as he began drowning in his past regrets once more. Glenn! A powerful yell from his old friend snapped him back to reality. Rufus had seized Glenn's lapels and was shaking him. You should know better than this. Think of absolutely nothing else besides the operation. The only thing that matters right now is saving Hugo's life. This boy, he believes in you. Show him his trust was not misplaced. Glenn was taken aback. He looked at the sleeping boy, whose heart lay exposed on the operating table. Thump. 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 The heart pounded as if calling out to Glenn, telling him that the boy still lived and could still be saved. That's right. This isn't the time to be spacing out, Glenn thought. He took a brief moment to compose himself, and once again faced Hugo, his eyes set with resolve once more. Seeing this, Rufus let go of him and signaled to the others to resume the operation. Sherry sighed in relief and readied herself to continue. Rufus assumed the position opposite Glenn. It was time to perform the new technique, the segment of the operation that Glenn had refined since their last attempt. The tumor had a secret. With the exception of the central part that secreted the toxin responsible for the crystallizing effect, it was almost completely harmless. Given time, it would be reabsorbed into the rest of the nearby heart tissue with no ill effects. In other words, so long as the toxic segment was excised, there was no need to remove the rest. This small change to the procedure would have made all the difference in Katerina's surgery. When Glenn discovered this during his research, pangs of regret dug deep into his chest. However, Katerina and Sherry's words had turned his regrets into gratitude. This refined technique existed and could be used to save so many lives, all thanks to Katerina's sacrifice. A small smile crossed Glenn's lips as he briefly reflected on all of this. A heart and lung machine was connected, and drugs were administered to temporarily halt Hugo's heart. Both were cutting-edge medical technology that Rufus had made special orders to obtain for this operation. With the heart lying still, Glenn carefully adjusted it to have a closer look at the tumor. Removing only the central part would require several extremely precise cuts. One wrong move, and the walls of the heart would be injured. But, if successful... They could safely extract the toxins while avoiding a repeat of Katerina's complications. Sherry folded her hands. Katerina, please lend Glenn your strength. She whispered in prayer. Glenn slowly lowered his scalpel down toward the darkened tumor. Sherry, Rufus, and the other doctors closely watched the sharpened tip, each of them holding their breath. Outside the room, Hugo's parents, fraught with worry, fervently prayed to the goddess for their son's survival. They had dutifully waited since the surgery began for what felt like an agonizingly long amount of time, and they were nearly at their wit's end. Just as they thought they couldn't take any more, the operating light turned off. Their eyes snapped to the door, anxious for answers. Was everything okay? Would their son live? The door opened, and Glenn's large silhouette filled its frame. Hugo's parents rushed toward him, their desperate hope plain on their worried faces. Glenn looked at the two of them and slowly removed his surgical mask. Behind it, his face was covered in a wide grin. Finale. Glenn. A month later, in a private room at Ameria General Hospital's children's ward, the sound of a violin drifted out from Hugo's room. Both his hands had reverted to their former tender softness, and their natural hue had been restored. Not a trace of the unnatural green luster remained. However, sensation had not quite yet returned to Hugo's fingertips, making the task of deftly wielding a violin bow difficult for even one of Hugo's natural talent. 
Despite this, he simply could not wait any longer to return to his beloved music after being deprived of it for so long. His parents were visiting that day, and he tried to play an advanced song at his usual level for them, but the only sounds the violin gave off were a series of shrill screeches. His parents, forced smiles on their faces, encouraged him, but Hugo didn't seem to mind one bit. A genius such as myself needs to try some avant-garde pieces once in a while, he said with a cheeky grin, causing his parents to laugh. He could play violin once again. That was more than enough for him, and he couldn't help but be ecstatic for that fact alone. He continued to play his strange experimental piece, and the three of them laughed together. The sounds of the small concert drifted up to Glenn as he stood on the rooftop and looked down at the city once more. He had been stopping by the hospital every so often to observe Hugo's post-operation recovery. After finishing his regular medical examination, he had taken a liking to going up to the rooftop. He'd lean on the railing, gaze down at the city streets, and feel the breeze on his face. The sights from the roof seemed different to him now. The sights and sounds a little more warm and inviting. He still preferred the familiarity of the dingy streets he'd become accustomed to but this part of the city was nice in its own way. On this particular day, Rufus and Sherry had joined him on the roof. Glenn, are you listening? Rufus questioned him. He and several others at the hospital had spent the last month trying to recruit Glenn. Don't you think it would be best for everyone if you worked here? There had been an especially strong push to hire Glenn from the medical specialists that had seen his surgical skills firsthand. They considered it a regrettable waste for a man of his obvious skill to live in obscurity in the downtown district. You invented an entirely new surgical procedure to reverse crystallization, Rufus told him as they gazed down at the city streets. You could make a name for yourself here, as a respectable doctor. However, just like every time prior, Glenn's answer was a stubborn, No. There are many people that come to my clinic downtown, he explained. They depend on me, and I don't intend to leave them now. I might just be some back alley doctor, but I'm their back alley doctor, you know? Glenn said with a grin. I see. A pity, then, Rufus replied, a small smile flickering across his face. Sherry checked her watch and let out a small gasp. Ah, uh, doctor, isn't it almost time for your rounds? Rufus nodded and turned to leave but looked back at Glenn before he left. Then continue living as a back alley doctor, he said. Just be sure you can proudly tell Katerina when next you see her that the path you chose was one you don't regret. With this, Rufus left. Such a harsh type of encouragement from this old friend brought an annoyed smirk to Glenn's face. I don't need you to tell me that, he muttered. Glenn and Sherry were left alone on the rooftop, there was an awkward silence between the two, made all the more apparent by the occasional screeches of Hugo's violin drifting out of his window. The silence continued until Glenn, unable to bear it any further, wordlessly turned and began heading to the exit. Before he could make his escape, however, Sherry let out a soft, um, that stopped him in his tracks. Dr. Glenn, I just wanted to thank you so much for everything you've done, she said. I feel like I finally understand why my sister chose you. After a decade of being repaid with a gun to his back, hearing such a formal, heartfelt thanks coming from the same direction threw Glenn off a bit. There's no need for that, he responded. His voice was softer, more sincere than normal. Because of you, I was able to understand what happened with Katerina. So I guess I'm the one who should be thanking you. Sherry was surprised by the sudden shift in attitude compared to Glenn's normal wry deflections. Now that I think about it, she said, they told me that you didn't take payment for the surgery, doctor. In recognition of his miraculous surgery, the hospital had offered him a payment of Mira. Though there were laws that restricted the amount they could give him, it was still an incredible sum of Mira to the average person. Glenn had turned it down, however, telling them to spend it on Hugo's post-op expenses. Well, I don't want to accept their chump change, said Glenn, quickly returning to his usual demeanor. But I guess. Once that brat's well enough to get on stage again, I'll have him send me free tickets to all of his concerts. <laughs>
The thought of the infamous back alley doctor, Glenn, attending a fancy violin concert brought a smile to Sherry's face. Doctor, do you remember when I first visited you? Sherry asked. I said this wasn't a job from the hospital. It was a personal request. So if you aren't interested in the hospital's payment... Her voice lowered to a soft purr. Perhaps I could pay you... personally. What? Suddenly flustered, Glenn turned around, only to find Cherry standing there giggling, a mischievous smile on her face. Glenn, beat red and a tiny bit miffed at being the victim of such a prank, turned and quickly retreated from the hospital. Sherry, now alone on the rooftop, leaned down on the railing where Glenn had been. She looked up at the sky cheerfully. He's a wonderful person, Katerina, she whispered, as a soft breeze fluttered by and a few harmonious notes from a violin drifted up to her ears. She almost felt like she could hear her sister laughing.